This video covers chapter 12, interest rate forwards and options. It's the first of two videos. This video uh, and, and this chapter is about interest rate forwards and, uh, and options, uh, meaning it's looking at interest rates directly. We have in the past looked at, for example, and considered uh, bond futures contracts and similar type contracts where you're looking at uh, a contract on a bond. And then what happened was when you're looking at the valuation of a bond, you have these inverse relationships between bonds and interest rates, which makes things a little more complicated. Well, in this chapter, we're really not looking at bond prices. We're looking directly at interest rates and payoffs directly associated with interest rates. So the first part of the, the, this video will cover euro dollar deposits, which are a, should be a review. Uh, we did cover them very briefly in previous chapters. Um, we will look at forward rate agreements, which we've seen before in chapter 11. And we'll look at the long and the short motivation. And with a forward rate agreement, the underlying can be thought of as a euro dollar deposit. So that's why I first back up and look at euro dollar deposits, then look at forward rate agreements because forward rate agreements are um, based on euro dollar deposit rates. Then we'll look at the forward rate, which is denoted as F in much of the text uh, in this chapter. Um, and we'll look at the forward rate, which comes from the yield curve. LIBOR yield curve to be specific. Then we'll look at timelines which are sorely lacking in the textbook. Uh, timelines will really help visualize what's going on to the point where, you know, you have, a, we, there, there's a number of large equations in there with a lot of subscripts. Um, and, and, you know, you don't really need to memorize that. Um, and after a while, you'll get an intuitive feel, I think, if you can visualize what's going on in the timeline. We'll look at payoffs, and here there's it's tr it's a little tricky in that when we look at forward rate agreements, there's two payoffs. There's a payoff to the euro dollar deposit, the underlying, and then there's a payoff to the forward rate agreement, and we need to distinguish those, and we can distinguish them on the timeline. Then what we'll do is we'll look at valuation, um, and we, we already know some of the answers to valuation. When you first enter into a forward rate agreement, the forward rate agreement has no value. It's a zero value. The expected value of what you expect to receive equals the expected value of what you expect to pay. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's because we're, you know, you're, you're picking off interest rates that come from the yield curve and the yield curve determines the interest rate that you expect to receive or pay and you set the forward rate accordingly. Now, um, so, so it's pretty easy to see that a forward rate when you at inception, a forward rate contract is, is zero. Just like when you entered into a, a forward contract on corn, uh, you know, back several chapters ago, the, the forward contract was worth zero because the expected value of the corn that you, that you expected to receive was what you expected to pay. So the net present value, so to speak, is zero. Well, the valuation technique and issue comes into play when you have a forward contract that's already existing and you want to value it. For example, you want to um, value it to, to record it on your balance sheet. So when you first enter into a forward rate agreement, there is no balance sheet entry, so to speak. There's no balance sheet effects um, in, in net, net balance sheet effects. There's an asset and there's a liability, but they net to zero. But when you have a, a contract you lock in a specific interest rate and time goes by, you have a gain or a loss, which means your asset and your liabilities are not quite aligning up equally, which causes your gain or loss. And so uh, we need to look at valuation with respect to interest rate um, contracts. Okay, let's start off looking at euro dollar deposits briefly, which we've seen before. Euro dollar deposits are U.S. dollar denominated deposits held in a bank outside of the U.S. It could be any country outside of the U.S., but we'll focus on U on the U.K. and specifically London, because that's the world one of the world's financial centers. And so the interest rate associated with the deposits that we'll be looking at is LIBOR. And so LIBOR is one of the most popular interest rates in in the world, um, and it reflects economic activity. 
uh, in, the, in the financial markets, and it's very liquid. So by convention, most interest rate derivative contracts are based on LIBOR. So what we want to do is look at what, how your deposit kind of works. So you have basically a time period. So when you have a euro dollar deposit, there has to be a time period in which the money is being held. And so um, the, the euro dollar deposit uh, works off of what's called LIBOR um, interest rate calculations, which is an add-on rate. And what we mean by that is you take one dollar invested, dropped into a, a deposit, and what will happen is you'll get paid back the LIBOR rate, which will denote L. And if the period, the maturity period, M, for the deposit, here's M, M covers that whole period, which is a fraction of a year. Most of these deposits are, for example, 30-day, 60-day, 90-day, 180. Um, we often, in, in, in trying to teach this material, use 90 and 100-day periods. By convention, it makes it easier to do the calculations and get comfortable with. But there could be other other day periods there. Okay, and so um, this is how the interest rates work. So you you deposit a dollar, and when things when it matures, so there's the dollar gets paid here. When the deposit matures, you get paid this whole amount. And so if if LIBOR was 4% okay, and M was equal to 90 days, then we would get, we'd drop in a dollar and we'd get the 0 0.04 times 90 over 360 and we would end up with a dollar one, or sorry, dollar four. We'd end up with a dollar four payoff at maturity here of the euro dollar deposit that's called the add-on method it's a look just for a step back you don't you shouldn't really uh, pay attention to this at this moment but if you're wondering well why what's the add-on method compared to another method there's discount methods where you would look at the payoff here and discount it backwards to figure out what the payment would be these euro deposits are this is the LIBOR convention take the deposit amount and add the interest and that's your payoff Okay, so now let's look at um, forward rate agreements. Okay, forward rate agreements. And so uh, a forward rate agreement basically looks at um, a euro dollar deposit in the future. So here's the M periods that we had. Um, and this is the euro dollar deposit that's that that uh, period that we just looked at but we're starting off at time zero this deposit will take place at a future point in time and so we can lock in the forward rate here that's associated with this deposit and we'll call that forward rate f for the moment because that's it's the fixed rate that we're going to lock into so if you go long a forward rate agreement it implies you're going to receive floating. And if you receive floating, you really don't need to describe it any further because receive floating means you're going to pay fixed. And fixed is that F right here. Okay. So um, what happens with a long forward rate agreement, if you speculate in a, in a, in a long forward rate agreement, since you're receiving floating, you want you want LIBOR to go up. So here's LIBOR on this axis. Here's your payoffs. You break even if if what you received in this time period is what you locked in to pay. You break even, but if rates go up, your payoff is positive. If rates go down, your payoff is negative. So this is a long position. It's basically long in an interest rate. So just don't confuse that with being long in a bond type instrument because remember that inverse relationship that makes it confusing what we're doing here is we're long the interest rate and so when interest rates go up we make money just like more long stocks we buy the stocks uh, and we want stocks to go up to make money
Okay, so that's a speculative position. Now, if we if we um, if we make a a, um, a loan, okay, if we have a floating rate loan, and we want to hedge that floating rate loan, right? Let's see what happens now. So if we have a floating rate loan, let's see if I get a different color here. A floating rate loan looks like this. Okay? If we borrow money, okay, we borrow money in, in, in a floating rate. Okay, that's blue, by the way. If you can't see it, I'm writing in blue. So if you borrow at a floating rate, when interest rates go up, oh, you're feeling the pinch, right? And when interest rates go down, you're kind of happy because you're paying that low floating rate. Well, notice what happens. If you're long a forward rate agreement, long that interest rate, and you borrow money, when you're borrowing money, you're basically short the interest rate, so to speak, because remember when you short something and the, interest in this, and the price goes down, then you make money, and if the price goes up, you lose. So what you see here is if you go long a forward rate agreement where we receive floating and pay fixed, you can use that to offset a and hedge a borrowing in which you're paying floating. Now, um, it's, you don't have to have too much of an imagination to know what a short position looks like in a forward rate agreement. Oops. This is F. So here's your forward rate agreement where you're short. That can be used to offset or to hedge. So this would be the speculative short forward. It can be used to hedge a, a loan that was extended at a floating rate. So if you extended a loan, made a loan to somebody at a floating rate, and interest rates fell, you wouldn't be too happy you made that floating loan uh, but with the forward rate short a forward rate agreement the two offset each other okay so that's the basics of um, your uh, uh, forward rate agreements from a long and a short position and the motivation form that you can speculate or you can use them for hedging purposes now what we want to do is let's look at the timeline associated with forward rate agreements because you know the textbook it, it's to me it, it's just dying it's begging for a, for the author to put in a timeline so um, it would make some of the math and the notation around the subscripts for example and and um, the time timing convention and the payoffs um, to, to make that more concrete uh, the, the text should have a, a timeline so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put show you a timeline so the timeline works like this, and I spent some time to actually draw one in the notes electronically. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at an A by B forward rate agreement. And that's the convention, the way they're usually quoted. You talk about a forward rate agreement. Um, you're talking about an A by B, and these are usually designated in months forward rate agreement. So let me actually draw this before we get any further. Okay, time zero. And then, so, um, an A by B forward rate agreement covers an interest rate on a euro dollar deposit that starts right here at point A. And the euro dollar deposit matures right here, okay, at point B, okay? So this whole period right here is covered by B months. So when you see a forward rate agreement quote that's an A by B, you know it starts this many months into the future, and the euro dollar deposit covers this time period, and in days, it's designated as M, maturity in days. Okay. So what happens is you enter into a forward rate agreement here. You start a forward rate agreement, and it starts forward. Okay, And so that's why it's called a forward rate agreement. You're locking in rates here 
into the future and you're locking in you know a forward a forward interest rate okay now um, recall that I just told you that the euro dollar deposit pays off here okay that's the euro dollar deposit payoff now remember a forward rate agreement the underlying is this deposit okay so the the, the your, the underlying pays off here, but the structure of a forward rate agreement is the forward rate agreement pays off at point A. Okay? And the payoff for this forward rate agreement at point A is, is this. It's going to be, think of it this way, is the notional value because you, um, you got to have a certain contract size, so to speak. And then you have to have a certain number of days in which you're covering that. But let me let me um, write this out here. So you're going to look. You're going to get L, the floating rate. Okay. In, in this case, you're going to get L, the floating rate. And you're locked in to pay F, the fixed rate. Okay. And so um, you need to adjust that for the M days. That you're going to be paying that your, this deposit works so, so what happens is you're going to look at the difference between the fixed rate that you locked in the fixed and the floating rate that you're receiving here you know, on a on a long forward rate agreement right that so right here right here is the payoff at this point B okay that's the payoff for the underlying but forward rate agreements pay off at point A. So all we have to do is discount that. And what do we discount it by? Well, we discount it by LIBOR. And it's the LIBOR that starts at point H in time. In other words, H in time means, in terms of days, H is this. So after H days, so you're going to look at where this is, think of this as point H right here. And so the spot rate at this point in time that covers this M period is what you're going to be discounting it for over the M period. M out of 360, the 360 convention as 360 days per in a year and each month as 30 days. So that is the spot rate that starts at point H right here at the point A. And it's H days uh, so what's confusing about it is, and this is just the nature of the, of the beast, is that forward rate agreements are often specified in terms of months between the A and the B, but when you start calculating values and payoffs, you need to do things in days. And that's, that's why you have a, um, a, the alphabet system here. So again, to summarize, take a look at this. You start off at time zero, you enter into a forward rate agreement, and often you enter into a forward rate agreement because you're going to borrow sometime in the future. You don't know what interest rates are going to be, or you could be lending money sometime in the future. Okay? So you want to offset that, then that's what a forward rate agreement can do for you, is offset uh, the, the risk associated with unknown interest rates that start in the future. So this is the notation and the formula for the payoff for being long a forward rate agreement. Okay, so notice you make money when interest rates go up because there's a positive sign in front of that. The negative means you locked in the pay, a fixed, F is a fixed or a forward rate. So the payoff on a short forward rate agreement is the notional value times uh, F minus the floating rate LIBOR. So you're paying the floating, that's the negative sign. You're receiving the positive fixed, put a little positive sign if you want. Um, but you need to adjust it for the length of the euro dollar deposit, the maturity, and there's the, at, there, there's, and it feels like the add-on interest principle here, LIBOR. And then you have the your, the um, the spot rate that starts at period H. 
right here again. Starts at period H and goes through at period M. So we need to discount it for that time period. Now let's jump right into an example. And on page five of my notes, it starts describing a problem. It says, suppose you go long a three by 12 forward rate agreement with a locked in rate of 3%. The notional value is $5 million. And at expiration of the forward rate agreement, the 270 day LIBOR turns out to be 2%. What is the payoff to the forward rate agreement? And what do you receive? Or when do you receive the payoff? Okay, so the, the question begs a timeline. Okay, start off at time zero. This will be 12 months from now. The forward rate agreement um, here. This will be the payoff to the forward rate agreement right here. So this is a three by three by 12. Okay, and here's the three months. Here is the nine remaining months. So that's M equals 270. And this is H, little h, equals 90. Okay, so we got the days set up. The days add up to 360, which equals uh, 12 months. And um, we know the payoff to the forward rate agreement will be here. Okay, and that payoff is a function of the payoff for the euro dollar deposit, which pays off here. And we discount it back to month three in this case. So um, the numbers will be... Uh, the notional value, so the payoff here, will be the notional value of $5 million times the 2%. That's what, that's what the 270-day the, uh, the li 270 LIBOR at this point covers uh, is, is based is a 2% interest rate according to the problem. It turned out to be 2%. We locked in 3% in a long forward rate agreement. So we locked in to pay this. And then we need to adjust it for, remember, interest rates are always on an annual basis. And so we need to adjust it for the, the time period, this time period here for the euro dollar deposit. So that is the payoff right here. This right here is the payoff to the euro dollar deposit at the end of that period. But what we need to do is we need to figure out the payoff to the forward rate agreement, okay? And that's simply discounting this whole thing by one plus the 2%, that's the interest rate that applies to this period, adjusted for the 270 day period, okay? And so when we do that, the whole thing equals um, minus 37,500. Okay, so you ask yourself, does that make sense? Um, oops, this the top part of this. Watch out here. The top part is 37,500. And so when you discount it with this factor in there, it's minus 36,946. That's the full rate agreement payoff. Okay, so this is this is just the top part of this fraction, and when you discount it, really the the payoff is thirty six negative thirty six nine forty six, and so you can ask yourself, does this make sense? And uh, sure, it does. You've locked in to pay three percent. Um, you were hoping, remember, you were hoping that rates actually went up but they didn't, rates went down, so you lost a little bit, uh, according to that payoff graph that I showed you earlier. Now, the next question is, can the example is continued? And the continuation says, what is the forward rate agreement worth at time t? At time t equals three months, okay? If you expect at time t equals zero, that 270-day LIBOR will be 3% in three months. Woo! Okay, what it's saying is, here, this is what that question is saying, and the answer is quite easy. It's saying you form expectations. You're sitting right here, right now. Um, T equals zero. What are your expectations? Um, 
And so you're looking at, this so is what is the forward rate agreement worth at time t equals three? So what is it worth? In other words, what is the payoff here? Um, when you, if you expect 270 day LIBOR, right, to be 3% in three months. So remember, we locked in, we locked in 3%. Well, if we locked in 3% and we expect 3%, well, the, the forward rate agreement is, is properly valued, is really what we're saying. To, um, really what we're saying is, look, you expected 3%, and that's how you price the forward rate agreement at inception. The present value of what you expect to receive and the present value of what you expect to pay will equal. So therefore, mathematically, the payoff right here is the $5 million dollars times 0.03 minus 0.03 lock this is the locked in rate and this is the rate you expect to receive adjusted for time then discounted again discounted at the rate that applies 360 divided by 360 oh, two, 270 divided by um, 360 it's 270 divided by 360. And that whole thing comes out to be zero because this is zero. So you didn't really didn't have to do any of the math. And so what is the value? The value of the forward rate agreement is zero at this point in time. And so if the value of the forward rate agreement is zero here, it's got to be zero here also. Now, let's go uh, to work another problem. And it says, um, assume you shorted the forward rate agreement above. Okay, so let's say you short instead. You went short the forward rate agreement above at 3%. And the 270 day LIBOR rate in three months turned out to be 5%. What would be your profit or loss on the forward rate agreement at expiration? In other words, at T equals three. Okay, so the timeline again. Zero, three, twelve. Now we're short a forward rate agreement at three percent. So we basically locked in three percent here. That's what we just locked in as F. Okay, and then what happens is we start. So we lock in at this point. We go through time, and at this when we get the T three, we find out that the actual rate is 0.05, 5%. And the actual rate is 5%. So what's the payoff? Well, the two payoffs technically. There's the payoff to the euro dollar, and that's going to be 5 million times the 0.03, because when we short, remember when we short, we're going to collect this 0.03. We locked in paying the, the floating rate, and it's going to be adjusted for the fraction of a year that this period covers, the euro dollar deposit covers. Now, so that's the payoff here. Now, the overall payoff at period three is nothing but the present value of this, and that's the one plus 0.05, the actual full, the actual rate here adjust for 270 over 360. And so this value comes out to be 72, 289 negative. Negative, let's see, does that make sense? Well, remember, we're, sh we're short a forward rate contract. In your head, you should have this picture in your mind. And it should be centered here at the break-even point at 3%. And when rates go up, we lose. So that accounts for the 72,289 negative sign. Now what we want to do is we want to see where that locked in forward rate comes from. F that we've been talking about. The formula in the text is kind of big and ugly, but we'll, um, let's, let's look at it and we'll derive it. So the forward rate that we're looking at that gets locked in is is 
is this formula. Oops, minus one there. And then whenever you see whenever you see the multiplication of 360 over M, that just means you're annualizing it. Because remember, these rates here are annualized. These are spot rates starting from today, okay? And we're looking at um, an entire lifespan okay, from period H all the way to the end, and this covers, um, this is the euro dollar deposit area space, and then M covers that time horizon, so this is also H, this is H, so another way to describe it. And so, um, this is the, the yield curve, or sorry, this is the LIBOR spot rate, starts at time zero, and looks out and sees, okay, what is the rate that covers this entire time span? Okay, and you need to adjust it for the fraction of a year that this time span covers. Okay, and then what you're going to do is you're going to divide that, this top spot rate by the spot rate that starts right here that only covers through period H. Okay, that's what the H is here standing for. Now, so what you're doing is this forward rate, F, is the interest rate that, that's right here. Um, and that's just taking, basically, dividing out the rate that you cover for the very long period here and dividing it by the, the rate that's covering the short period. Okay, but we need to do it in terms of LIBOR math, and that's what we're going to do. I'm going to derive it from the same type of math that we looked at in, in Chapter 11. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to say, look, let's look at um, let's look at the idea of investing one dollar over this time horizon. So we're going to invest one dollar over this time horizon versus investing one dollar over this time horizon h right and then reinvesting it at point h for this period of time so if we ignore risk differences and we we basically say look you should be indifferent between investing for this long period versus investing for this short period and then rolling it over into this new forward rate f okay that's what we're saying so if we take one dollar and we invest it for the very for the long period, okay, this is what we're going to get. We're going to get we're going to earn this amount for that long period. That should equal one dollar invested uh, for the short period. H. Okay times the period covered during the during the second period the rollover period and we're going to call the interest rate associated with that rollover period we're going to describe it as fh so this is the forward rate that starts at period h covers m or m periods of m over 360 fractions of a year okay so that's the, that's basically the formula these two sides should equal, and all we have to do is, is solve, really, what this formula here is doing. This formula right here, the big ugly formula here, well, this is not much prettier, but <laughs> solving for, for H, or for FH, okay? So you know the ones cancel out, that makes it easy. Um, so what you do is you take this whole side right here, right here, and divide it by this side, Okay, because it, you know basically math. Um, this is a, this is b, this is c. We're saying a divided by b equals c. Okay, right there. So you solve that out. You you rearrange the math, and then you solve for for h, and you end up with this formula but with a little h as a subscript and an m to clarify the time period that that f is associated with and when it starts. Now, let's, let's use this, this rate here now for valuing a forward rate agreement after its inception. 
Okay, so what we mean by that is, first of all, draw a timeline. There's the H period, there's period H, here's M for the Euro de dollar deposit. And what we're looking at here from, um, is we're asking, what is the value of the forward rate agreement? For example, at point G in the timeline. So we start out with the value of the forward rate agreement at time zero is equal to zero because the expected value of what the, the value of what you expect to receive is equal to the value of what you expect to pay, like any forward or future con uh, any forward contract at initiation, it's zero. But now what happens is time goes on, time marches on, and at point G, interest rates change, the yield curve shifts shifts. So um, the, the, what you expect to receive or what you expect to pay, depending if you're long or short, changes while the fixed rate is locked in. So you will get a, either a profit or a loss, and that's your gain or loss on your, on your forward rate agreement. The change in the value of your forward rate agreement would be your gain or loss on it. Now, so the value of the forward rate agreement, the FRA, it's going to equal this. It's really the difference between the two rates. Okay, so it's the new forward rate that we're going to, at this point in time, recognize this period. Okay, the new forward rate, and then we still have the same old locked in rate, but we need to adjust it for the period M over 360. And then we need to, hey, discount it back. And so we need to discount this whole thing back. And that's um, this entire period minus the G period, discount it back to point G. Okay, so we started out at time zero, we are now at time G. So you technically could put a little subscript G here, say, look, this is the value of the forward rate agreement at time G. And so we need to discount it back um, at the spot rate at time G. So this is the rate that we spot and see, and it covers H plus M this whole period minus this G period. In other words, it covers this whole period be between my fingers. And then we need to adjust it for the time frame. And there you have it. That's the difference. So really what it boils down to is the, your, your gain or loss on the forward rate agreement is the difference between your locked-in rate and your new, full, new forward rate. And then you got to adjust it for the time frame that you're looking at. And that's where nearly all this junky notation comes in, is trying to keep track of all that. It was time frame. So let's do an example. Suppose you enter a long position of a forward rate a long position in a two by eight forward rate agreement. Notional value, 10 million. Okay. The forward rate starting in 60 days and ending in 240 days is 4%. So the price you locked in is 4%. Now assume that 40 days have elapsed. Okay. The yield curve is at the 40th day. Okay. Uh, at the 40th day, G equals 40, reveals that the spot rate for the next 20 days is 3%. So I think what we need to do is map this out here. Zero, um, we have the period H, and this covers, let's see, this was kind of not the scale, but that's 60 days, and this is... Um, 8 times 30, 240 days here, okay, um, the forward rate at this point, this is 4% that we expect covering this, this time frame here. We have a $10 million notional value, and so now what happens is um, at day at G, 40, this is G equals 40, 40 days, Right? This says, okay, now the, the spot rate for the next 20 days is going to be 3%, okay? 
and the spot rate for the next 200 days, let me draw it down here, the next 200 days is 5%. Okay. Now, um, compute the forward rate that starts in 20 days. So remember, we're right here. What is the forward rate that starts in 20 days? Oh, I should put a little subscript zero here because that's the rate we're, we've, we're locking, we've locked in. But what is the forward rate that starts in 20 days, right? And then ends 200 days, or ends all the way at day uh, 240, okay? Which is um, a total of 200 days later. This is 200 days later. Okay, to solve the problem, the forward rate, we're going to calculate the, so that's the first thing we need to do, is we need to calculate the forward rate so that we can feed it into this formula. We're really calculating this Fg, and that is F40, and it covers 180 days, okay, there's 180 days right there, equal to... Okay, so what you see here is like I told you before, okay, we're, so we're starting at this point now, and we need to know that the top part of this fraction, right, is, is the spot rate at this point that covers this, this 200 day period, okay, from day 40 to 240, right here, that's the top rate, and we're going to divide it by this little, this little covered, this little period right here, that's that rate, okay. And that's at point 40, covers 20 days, it's this period. So what we need to do is take the 5% divided by the 3%, basically, to come up with what this future, what that forward rate will be. And when we do the math, it comes out to be, um, let me write it out here, kind of, kind of long. Okay, so we're taking, whoa, we're taking, and this is spelled out and typed out in the notes for you, but look, we're taking that 5% and dividing it by the 3%, annualizing it, and when we get done, we get 0 0.052135, like 5.2%, okay? So in other words, 5% um, is, is equal to investing at 3% here, and then rolling it over and investing it for 5.2% over this period. Okay, so now with that, with this number in hand, let's compute the formula. Okay, oh, and what I left out, what I left out here, notice I forgot to say notional value, NV. Okay, um, <clears throat> the notional value, you need to multiply this whole thing by notional value. And so we start out, that's $10 million in this example. And we got 0 0.052135. So we're long this forward rate agreement. We're locked in the pay with the negative sign, 0 0.04. It's for a half a year is the underlying uh, euro dollar deposit period. <clears throat> and now we need to discount that back by Remember, the payoff starts here. We need to discount it back um, M and then H, this, this period. So basically 200 days is what we need to discount the whole thing back by. And that'll be one plus 0.05, the 5% 
that covers this period. And we get 59037 dollars positive. And so we ask ourselves, you know, does this make sense? And so, you know, you locked in 4%. According to your calculations, the, the interest rates went up. And so now they're up 121 basis points higher than what you had originally locked in. So the whole yield curve had shifted up. And so if you take that 121 basis points, multiply it by $10 million, adjust it for a half a year, multiply it by a half, and you get about $60,500 before you discount. So in other words, um, this whole fraction right here, the 10 million times the difference in rates multiplied by two comes out to be about $60,500. And now discount it back by the 5% rate and you get $59,000 for the payoff. We are now at the end of video one for chapter 12. And just one piece of advice before I end the video. So what you don't want to do is, is rely 100% on those formulas. Because if you do, you're going to get into a quiz or in an exam, you're going to look at the problem, and you're going to be unable to translate the problem into the formula. And in which case, you're going to be in trouble. So don't rely on the formulas themselves. Make sure you get some intuition, visualize the problem, and it makes it a lot easier to solve for it. And then ask yourself, is the answer reasonable given the situation? And there's ways to back into it roughly like I have shown you.